can we brought on to introduce? Uh, last can. Uh, uh, well, uh, in uh, 2015, of course, the University of Limerick uh, Minister produced uh, the uh, paper on the, the prevalence of zero-hour contracts, and I, I made a submission myself, I think, at the end of 2015 on that. We had the earlier discussion about precarious work um, and about uh, banded contracts. So uh, you announced a couple of weeks ago, I think, that uh, you're going to come forward with um, legislation on this. Um, uh, will you, in actual fact, um, um, legislate to effectively uh, uh, ban zero-hour contracts, and um, especially if, if and when contracts, uh, which, uh, where there is no contractual uh, obligation to give work at all. Uh, thanks, uh, Ken. Minister, you have two minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Les Ken Corla, and I want to thank uh, Deputy Brown for raising this is issue. And, um, I don't know we have already dealt with it, but I think it is important that we um, to talk about it again, because it is very important legislation, as you have rightly pointed out. On the 2nd of May, the Government approved draft legislative proposals as a response to the Programme for Government's commitment to address the problem caused by increased casualisation of work and to strengthen the regulation of precarious work. The draft legislation was referred to the Office of the Attorney General on the 4th of May for priority drafting of a bill. Regarding zero-hour contracts, the intention of the proposals is to invite the contagion of an increase in these practices in this jurisdiction. The proposals provide that an employer will no longer be able to engage an employee or on a contract within the meaning of Section 181A or 181C of the Organisation of Working Time Act, where the stated contracted hours and zeros are, are zero unless it is genuinely casual emergency cover or short-term relief work. Other employees, including those with uncertain hours and those on the if and when contracts, will benefit from the following proposals as well. Ensuring that employees are better informed about their employment arrangements and especially their core terms shortly after commencing work. Strengthening the provisions around the minimum payment to low paid workers who may be called to work for a period but not provided with that work. Providing that workers on low-hour con low contracts who consistently work more hours each week than provided in their contracts of employment are entitled to a placed into a band of hours that reflect the reality of the hours they have worked over a reference period. And also reinforcing the anti-victimisation provisions for employees who try to invoke a right under those provisions. Thank you. Deputy Brown. Well, I mean, obviously, it would be very important uh, for, for the act actual formulation of the, uh, the, you know, your approach to, to uh, ending uh, zero-hour contracts, because clearly, across a, a wide range of sectors of our economy, especially in retail, hospitality, in the in the caring uh, um, area as well, um, we've had we've seen, I think, what Mandate Trade Union has ca called, you know, uh, gross exploitation uh, of, of uh, workers, um, and uh, obviously, uh, over the next period in which the, the legislation has been drafted. It's really critical that I think organisations like, like uh, IBEC, who have you know, spoken out against imposing, I think, uh, what they call owner's restrictions, that you'd be prepared to stand up to them and that we'd, we'd be counting on ministers like Minister Halligan and Minister McGrath as well, perhaps to stiffen your resolve in that regard. And in particular, obviously, to deal, I know the Citizens Information Board uh, reported there that uh, something like 7% uh, uh, of its 1 million, million queries annually uh, relate to um, uh, employment and specifically to, um, uh, to zero hours and to if and when contracts, which are, of course, contracts without any contractual obligation to give hours uh, at all. So uh, I, I would look forward to legislation, but I mean, I, I hope again that this is something that you would move on. And does the government, I mean, the whole area of the gig, gig economy generally, uh, is, is the government, it's, it's a debate that's going on right now in the UK in relation to the, you know, as part of the general election, what people are prepared to do about companies Thank you, like Uber and so on in the gig economy, and if whether the, your government is thinking along the same lines, or, or uh, well, particularly the lines the Labour Party in the UK is thinking about, about taking drastic action about the gross maltreatment Minister, of workers. Please, yes. Thanks, uh, Can. Yeah, I'm aware of the Uber case actually in the UK at the moment. Obviously, um, it's, it's something we're monitoring very closely indeed, I have to say that to you. But uh, there are obviously going to be an appeal in that as well, so I prefer to say anything at the moment. But we are following very closely, could I say to you. Could I say, Deputy Brown, a lot of time and effort went into preparing this legislation. Uh, consultation, we had 48 submissions 
um, after the UL um, study was done. Uh, they were very useful, actually. Then we had the consultation with IBEC and with the unions as well. That was a lengthy period of time. You can well understand uh, the amount of bargaining and uh, people raising their own cases at those discussions. That, the discussions went on from September to March. Now, it's about good legislation, and I think the four areas that we're covering in the legislation are the areas that you outlined there this evening. Um, the first area is in relation that the employee is entitled to information when they start their job out, to know exactly who they're working for, the name and address of that employee as well, the hours they're working for, how much they're going to get paid. There are 15 areas there, 15 items there, but the, the employer doesn't have to apply, uh, um, um, provide those um, until the, the two months afterwards. But the, the, the main areas, I think, they won't be onerous on any employer to get that information. I think an employee is entitled to know that information. We hope that the legislation we put into place is balanced and um, that it will help low-paid workers. I know you represent low-paid workers, and it will help those low-paid workers as well. All right, the other, the yeah, there are two other, three other areas well, there. Maybe in my reply, I might get back to them back again. To okay. Deputy Bruin. Thank the Minister for that. I'll just ask him, just very briefly, uh, uh, like maybe other deputies have had some complaints as well about uh, job search websites uh, in, in relation to, um, in relation to uh, you know, constituents are concerned that some of the jobs which will be advertised don't actually exist uh, and are still are, are basically being used as a means for recruiters to access data on job seekers um, and, and uh, where sometimes misleading roles seem to be advertised, uh, mis mismatched salary versus experience and so on. And when the applicant is contacted saying the role has been filled, they're then told about um, uh, uh, alternative positions, which, you know, uh, again, kind of zero hour type positions, if and when type positions. So, uh, is there a sense, is this uh, an area where the department maybe could um, uh, examine the, the whole role of the recruitment um, uh, websites and recruiters generally uh, to make sure that they're, they're not acting as a, you know, a funnel uh, to, uh, uh, to take vulnerable uh, young people starting out their work career and put them into precarious employment? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cam. Minister. <coughs> The whole idea of the legislation was to eliminate precarious um, um, employment, and that's something I think we've done in the um, legislation that we are proposing now. That legislation, as I said, um, is gone to the Attorney General's Office uh, for priority drafting. And I think it's important that we get that back as soon as possible so that we uh, put in place the legislation to protect the low-paid workers. In relation to the, uh, the issues that you raised there on jobs being advertised, I'll follow that up for you, Deputy Brown, if you want me to, and maybe come back to you again. Or if you have more information on it, I certainly will discuss it with my officials in the department uh, so that we can see if we can deal with that type of, 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 of um, um, activity that's happening out there in relation to um, um, jobs that have been advertised. Uh, the future of work, obviously, it's a big issue. You mentioned the gig economy there, and um, I suppose uh, what's the way we'll be working in 10 years' time. But I think the one thing we should never forget are the rights of our employees, no matter what changes in the whole digital economy in the next five, ten years. There, are, there, is, some good there is good legislation out there. Uh, I think legislation has been proven uh, in the past, good employment legislation there, in the interest for employees. And we should bear that in mind in relation to moving forward with any legislation, uh, that the legislation is out there, is there, Thank no matter you, what changes come into in, in, uh, what that the digital economy is going to bring on us. And it will bring massive changes in the next five to ten years. But at the same time, we have to bear in mind people come first. Uh, question 58 is Deputy Bruins.